cool. Um, I think last time we uh, were speaking about the idea of Chalmers and Clark's extended mind hypothesis. Mm. Uh, it's, it's simple because I have a simple mind and everything that I know is simple. So uh, there, the whole idea, I don't think Dave actually believes in the extended mind. It's mostly Andy that's pushing it. Uh, but um, the essence of it is this. It's fine to talk about cognition as being, you know, everything that has to do with knowledge. You can say that libraries, libraries, the web, they're all part of cognition, right? So, I mean, if I want to look up something on Google, right? I mean, the way I find it is by clicking and getting Google. Mm -hmm. But, and this is related to stuff we're going to be talking about later, and that's also we talked about a little bit before. What makes something mental is not just that it's cognitive. It's not just that um, there's words involved. It's that it feels like something hmm. to hear and understand those words. Yep. And, and for example, if the distinction that Andy Clark and, uh, make, makes is, uh, what's the difference really whether, whether uh, somebody's phone number is in my cortex or on my notepad? Either way, you know, it's, uh, I, I look at the, the um, notepad and, the, and that's part of my cognition. And, and if I look it up in my head, then it's part of my cognition. The difference is, well, I, actually, um, it's not yeah. where it's encoded that matters. It's that the, the state in which the information is active in your head is a felt state. Hmm. And a felt state cannot be wider than a head. The information hmm. can be on the moon but the felt state is here. <laughs> yep. And so when you're talking about extended mm. cognition or extended consciousness, you're, you're, and the, 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 um, the intuition pump I give people is think of a migraine. Can you have an extended migraine? You can talk about the fact that five people are sitting around a table and, the, and there's bad news and they're all, they all have headaches. But there's no, the, the committee, that you know, the news was a headache for the committee is nonsense, of course, because a headache is only as wide as a head. Well, mental processes are only as wide as a head. Hmm. So until further notice, this is one of the things that a, um, another interviewer who was interviewing um, Andy Clark made the mistake that he extended the metaphor to um, mean extended consciousness. So, uh, but Andy sort of corrected him and said, "Well." Let's not go that far. That uh, a separate thing. So I think Andy's version of cognition um, doesn't include the felt sense. Uh, Did you say extended mind? Yes, that's what, that's the word mind, that they used in know, their so original so, so, in paper. Yeah. So you know, mm. so you know the word mind, and you know the uh, word mental. Okay, mm. mental and mind are all synonymous with conscious stuff. Okay, mm. I, there's. Uh, forget about Freud, forget about... It, it's true that the stuff that's going on in your head, whether it's going on in your head or on a piece of paper, most of it you're, you don't know what's going on. It's just happening there. It's not something you're feeling. But there are states mm. that you have, and those are the mental states, right? When you're, if you're in a delta sleep, you're not there. I mean, whatever is going on in your brain, that's, that's just internal stuff. It's like what's going on in your liver. It's going on in your body, but it's not your mind. Mm -hmm. the, your mind is when you're awake and conscious, Mm. Right, and that so he can't it, it, that distinction he makes between between mm. extended mind and extended consciousness is completely spurious. It's a, by the mm. way, uh, so let it might me not have been the oh. correct word like uh, to say extended mind, but it's kind of like our brains. Maybe n like there's only certain sections which are contributing to consciousness. Um, some people say, uh, and and that it's rather modular, in a sense. And we can't say that every aspect of our brain is conscious or, or contributes to the the conscious awareness. Um, and so, so what's extended then? What's if it's not extended? Of course, it is extended mind because he said extended mind. But if he didn't mean extended yeah. mental states, what does it mean? I think it just means what does extended it mean? processing. What, like but ex where's the, the what extended processing? Go the processing that's going on is going on in here. I get the output in my mind. So mm -hmm. if I Google it, and then, you know, I look for Andy Clark, and it brings me his homepage, okay? I got it off Google, but the stuff that's going on in the Google is not part of my mind, mm -hmm. and it's not part of the mental process. And why would I want to even call it cognition? 
I mean, cognition, I would say, is what's going on between your ears as mm. well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess people have different aesthetics it's, of how to use the word cognition then. <laughs> but is it okay? But is it just an aesthetic matter? What would what, what you use for a word? I mean, we're working on modeling cognition. Mm. The Turing test is about cognition. Is Google part of, of the Turing test? The robot goes and Googles something, and then you say, well, the Google is part of this extended thing that I'm testing. Well, in that case, you know, what, where's, what's the end of the robot? Mm. I guess what, that's who the, are you testing? I guess that then it's important to sort of, def, for, for Andy and Chalmers or whoever's extending the concept, uh, you, people don't usually refer to it as extended mind. They use distributed cognition. Um, yes, but it's a mm. weasel word, because what they mean by cognition is mental. Is it? Otherwise, what is cognition? Why do we, you know, is, is, a, is what's going on in Google while I'm not using it, is that my cognition? Is that cognition at all? Well, well people use cognition so in terms of like, you know, um, cognitive computing uh, as a description of yeah, the style of AI development. Is that the wrong word? Of, of course. What happened was that cogn cognitive science, I remember when it began, became very fancy and fashionable. And so everybody added it to what they were doing. You used to be doing cognitive. Uh, you used to be doing business administration. Now you're doing cognitive business administration. You used to be doing computing. Now it's cognitive computing. You used to be doing uh, uh, psychotherapy, and now they're calling it cognitive psychotherapy. Well, it was always yeah. true that in psychotherapy people were thinking, but this cognitive yeah. thing was just. And moreover, it's worse than that because it's it's intertwined with this with this hard problem of consciousness. And one of the ways that people weasel out of the hard problem of consciousness is with synonyms. They use words, well, I'm not, I'm not talking about mm. consciousness, I'm talking about awareness. I'm not talking about awareness, I'm talking about intentionality. I'm not talking about intentionality, I'm talking about qualia. I'm not talking about qualia, I'm talking about sentience. These are all just weasel words for mm. one thing. States that it feels like something to be in. Mm states that it feels like something to be in so don't talk about states that it doesn't feel like anything to be in because that's not what we're and and uh, that's not what we're talking about with cognition i guess you disagree with wittgenstein as um the meaning of its word is its use well that slogan was also fashionable for a while <laughs> but it doesn't it doesn't wash mm. uh, uh, the meaning of a word is not the meaning of apple is not its use mm -hmm. The meaning of an apple is whatever it is in your head that allows you to recognize and do with apples what you do with apples and feel what it feels like to identify an apple when somebody says apple. That's the meaning. And moreover, the definition in the d dictionary, if you don't know what apple means, can, t can give you the meaning on condition that the words in the definition are grounded. Hmm. Yes. So uh, I'll, I, I, let me. I'm not a philosopher, okay? And I, 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 there's, when when you have a good philosopher, and they're rare, they come in every few centuries. It's really nice to hear what they have to say. But most philosophy is journeyman philosophy, just like most biology is journeyman biology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in philosophy, it's really worthless, right? In biology, at least there's some low-level cumulative stuff that people are doing, or in physics, that is increasing knowledge. But in philosophy, it's just um, um, uh, bandwagons like meaning is use, extended cognition, etc. And then they have their 10-year spree, and then nobody cares afterwards. So I guess, well, what do you think is going... Do you think um, there's any shared grounding between a hive, uh, bees in a hive? No. Uh, remember, use my migraine test. Can a beehive have a migraine? If it can't, then there's, then, uh, uh, there's nothing that I yeah, share with it. All there is is bees that do things because, because they have their genetic programs and they have ways to interact. And they're very intelligent, extremely intelligent. Right, that, you know, they can learn things, they can play mm -hmm. with things, they can move things around. They can Ants solve are complex brilliant. navigation cha cha yeah. challenges. It's really fascinating. So, so, so all, they have all of the brain the size of like a sesame seed. It's incredible. Yeah, it, it it was a prejudice to think that a small brain couldn't do it. I mean, why yeah. would we have that prejudice? We know what we can do with a with with a transistor and with a with a microchip. So why would we be imagine that just because it's small, it can't do a lot of stuff? Mm. But anyway, yeah. the point is, what, this, what is this hive business? It's, again, the distributed cognition notion. There's no such thing. If a, if a bunch of bees together 
can't have a, if, if that bunch doesn't have a mental state, it's not collective cognition, it's just collaboration, right? It's, it's individual cognizing bees that are collaborating, just like individual cognizing humans are collaborating. And mm -hmm. then there's cognitive technology. My main critique of Clark and Chalmers is not in that article that you read, but in another article called, about, I think it was called Cognitive Technology. The ma mistake they made is the distinction between cognition, which only happens in my head, and cognitive uh, co technology, which is stuff like a computer, a telescope, glasses, uh, virtual reality. Those are, those are just things that what, is, what it's extending, in a sense, is my reach, right? I mean, I, I, can, run fa I can move faster with, uh, with a car, but that's not a biological motion. That's just a, a piece of technology that extends my, my, um, my uh, reach, my spatial reach. If I'm working a crane, that's a good example as well. But it doesn't well. extend I mean, your hand, it extends your reach. Th that's so right. So what, what, what would you say the equivalent word to use is to extend your brain um, if you're using a computer? What would be? So, so what What are you asking me to so, name? So, so, so if I, a car extends, or if a car or um, extends your reach or your speed, yeah. What does a computer do? Um, you know, it extends my reach and my speed, but my it's instead of being my my spatial reach, it's my it's my informational reach. reach. It can it can get me books. Uh, you don't even have to go to go to a computer. I can look up things in a book. Remember, his whole in, intuition came from a notepad, right? They all. If I if I if I uh, scribble down a telephone number, then I don't have to have it coded in my head. And if I, and, and in fact, Google is making us all lose our our internal represent or our internal store because we don't need it. We know, you know, necessity is the mother invention of the invention in cognition and the stuff that you don't mm. your brain knows you don't need to do yourself. It doesn't do. I can give you an example yeah. with language. For example, I I, I speak. A little Russian, uh, and I can get by, mm. but I can really only do it with people who can't speak English better than I can speak Russian. Because if they can speak English better than they can uh, speak Russian, my brain quits. It says, "Don't try. Just ask them in English." <laughs> hey, um, interestingly, people are using GTP three um, to help them write books. Uh, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine who I just interviewed, Yosha Barker, mentioned him in the first interview. Uh, he um, had a conversation with Goethe uh, and Leibniz, or maybe not Leibniz, but he's, he's had conversations with dead writers and philosophers. <laughs> um, and he thinks that, that, you know, that they're convincing and interesting um, to an extent. So, what it's, is it, it, so, so, so what? this idea that, you know, we're, we're losing our ability to sort of think because we're offloading stuff onto our computers, it's going even further now. But, okay, tell me what he actually means. I mean, when he has a, a, a chat with Goethe, he, 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 mm. he asks stuff that, having read a ton of the, what Goethe and everybody else wrote, the thing gives him back something. Well, I he's mean, an AI guy. I don't think he's under any illusion that there's a ghost in the machine of Goethe sitting there. No, no, I, it's, there, not right? ghost, <laughs> it's not ghosts I'm thinking about mm. either. I'm just talking about what, what information is this giving him, is it, or is this an illusion? I mean... Uh, you know the Bible in a pin, right? You ask a question, you pick up a Bible, you stick a pin into it anywhere, open it up, put your hand on the first verse, and there's the answer, okay? Hmm. That's, and, and something similar happens with Hamlet and Polonius. He says, you see that cloud there, Polonius? Yeah, does it look like a camel? Doesn't it look like a camel? Yeah, sure, I see the hump, etc. But doesn't it look more like a weasel? Yeah, yeah, it's got it. Or isn't it a whale, etc.? We can take input and project an interpretation on it, and then he feels, oh, I've had a chat with Goethe. Mm. All you've had a chat with, if you, yeah, well, what, what you have is a, is, a, is a device that has, has digested all of the words that Goethe has, has pronounced, not what he means, not, but what he said, and then, and, then, and then uses them in order to make, predict, since it's all based on one word-to-word -word transition, predict what they're gonna say, uh, given certain questions, which it's also processed many different times. So it produces something sort of impressive that, that, uh, that uh, has a bit of Goethe in it, has words, some of it makes sense, not all of it. He gave uh, me the, the permission to publish it. 
So I've just sent you a copy. <laughs> okay, I've got it right it. now. The, mm. the conversation? Yeah. Oh, fine. I found a way to talk to you. Uh, let me just see what the... Uh, me, Johan, could you please translate the sentence into the German? The information is the neue Gott. What does that mean? Information is the new God. Can you explain this? I don't know uh, German no, myself. No, the information can uns helfen. Only information goes over here. So what's what's the what's the trick here? I mean, he's he's asking simple questions. He's giving sort of factual answers. I don't know if they're good to like a- answers, and then it's being translated into English. So, I mean, I don't this none of this. This is really the Bible in a pen. I mean, I don't recognize. I don't. Maybe a Goethe scholar could say whether there's something in this that that uh, that's Goethe characteristic. But this stuff is Siri Siri interactions. Well, it's oh, I it's, got it, it's it's um it's responding in old German. It's not responding in, in current German. So it's responding in the German that... Um, well, well you, 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 it would, wouldn't it? I mean, it's, yeah. it hasn't been trained in, in uh, modernizing old German. So what mm. the, all the words it's been sucking in have been old. So it's, gonna, it's bound to be that. But is that a surprise? Well, it'd be a surprise to people. I think, it, I think people are surprised whether they should be surprised. Is that I don't, know if you, I don't know if you read uh, what I wrote uh, today. I spent some time answering some yeah, of yeah. your written stuff. I did stuff. read some of it, yeah. So this is what I call... Do you know what hermeneutics means? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, so this is basically text hermeneutics. The people who want to believe that the... That the uh, you called it the, a hermeneutical the, hall of mirrors? Hall of mirrors, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Uh, you're, 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 it, it, the program does stu- swallows text does stuff with it and then interacts with you and you and it's natural i mean you're interacting it's what it's saying is making sense so you're impressed it's it's understanding you it's not it's just using the contingencies to to uh predict not perfectly the kind of thing that is like if from the big statistical distribution it, it read what's the next word likely to be most likely to be i suppose hmm. I don't know how much how how far a distance it can keep track of. I, yeah. I was surprised by the group I was talking to that's really based on adjacency and not nothing bigger. I mean, it's a huge corpus, but it but it's not looking at long distance relations in the corpus, just very short distance relations. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm certain that um, Yosha isn't saying that Goethe is symbol grounding or the GPT three Goethe is symbol grounding. <laughs> Well, he better not. He better not say that. But is he is he saying it's understanding? So it's not understanding. It's clearly not grounded. Is there meaning? Is it? Is there any meaning in what he's saying? Or is this as much meaning as you get out of taking things? Well, the that meaning very appears often? in the mind reading it. Yes, that's why it's hermeneutics. It's in, it's here. It's mm. not there. So fine. I mean, I I'm reading mm. words c- put together by a computer program. Uh, based on predictions from Goethe, and my mind can, I understand English, so I can I can understand the English, and I can also, if I'm a Goethe scholar, I can also say, ah, that comes from there, that comes from there, yeah, that makes sense, he would say that, etc., etc. That's all exactly what you would expect from this kind of an approach. Hmm. Right. So, so you, I guess what people are surprised at is not the fact that it, is it, it, they're not surprised because they believe that it's a conscious ghost and machine, but it's because of the sophisticated output that such an algorithm can produce, convincingly sophisticated. I mean, like, if you didn't know that it was produced by GTP3, you might just think it was a human conversation. Yeah, yeah, just, like, just as you would with Siri for a while. Yeah. But it, but better than Siri. This is yeah, of course Siri. we agree. It's uh, <laughs> miles better than Siri, but the same kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And, but there, pe- but you see, the hermeneutics is not that. I mean, it's clear that when a message comes in in English, and I understand English, and it's written in correct in English, I'm interpreting it as as meaning what it says. Even it was just even if, even it was just coughed up by some sort of. A, uh, computer program, right? The hermeneutics comes when you project onto the computer program an understanding that isn't there or a meaning that isn't there. Mm. Dennett, when he says, ah, I get it, it thinks it should get its queen out early. That's the prediction we're talking about. It mm. doesn't think a thing. Mm. 
I, I posted um, about whether on, on a scale of 1 to 10, how worried would you be about the simple grounding problem in an AGI forum on Facebook? And there's a real f variety of responses, I can tell you. Uh, yeah. Um, some people oh, think that it's a, it is a real problem and it needs to be sort of addressed in order to achieve um, real AGI. And other people think that it's an illusion. Um, some people believe that it's it's sophistry. Yeah. Do they have reasons for for that? Of course, they have their own reasons. I, I can't really sum them up just right now. Uh, but like, uh, yeah. So one person, though, um, I asked him to describe what he thinks it is. And he believes that it's, it's this guy, Michael Holton. He, he seems rather switched on. And he gave me a very tactical term for what he thinks is going on in simple grounding. And yes, I mean, I, I, I guess I became more familiar with some new words, or, or some, some words that I've been sort of introduced to before. And that's with transduction and, you know, this whole idea of acceptances and, and things like that. And he kind of likened it to a tree where the, the roots of the tree are the transducers and the ground is like the world that the yeah, roots no. are sort of growing into. And the trunk of the tree is the, the acceptor, which sort of categorizes things internally. And then the, the branches and the leaves are kind of like the neural network or, or the dictionary, where the meaning doesn't actually exist in the dictionaries, but the, the meaning exists in the trunk or the center of the tree. And the dictionary look up the, you know, just the leaves. So it was kind of, yeah, interesting to... Yeah, no, I, it's, it sounds like a, it sounds like a GTP3 account of what symbol grounding is. <laughs> symbol grounding is just taking a certain number of words and uh, putting them as labels on, on a certain number of categories that you already have and those categories that you learn through your senses and your motor system uh, by finding the features of the members that distinguish them from, from non-members. Once you've got those words grounded in their, in their categories, then if you have another thing, which is, I, we didn't talk about this, but a proposition is a miracle. It's trivial and it's a miracle. The idea that you can take a subject and a predicate and make not another, a, a longer word, a subject and a predicate, a sentence isn't a long word, even in the agglutinative languages where it is literally one word, um, it's an it's a it's an it's a an, a proposition. It's it's if saying something is the, is true. Where you just say apple, you're not saying anything. You're just naming a thing. You're you're categorizing. But when you say apple red, meaning apple is red, you're making a proposition. And with that capacity to make a proposition out of grounded. Um, categories, you've opened up the universe. You can, every, pro, every po possible proposition can be reached by natural language in that way. Mm. That was a question I was going to ask. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, that's how simple gro symbol grounding is. If, yeah, of course, I could be completely wrong, <laughs> like everybody else. I'm just a pygmy. But um, if I were right, it would be that. It would be that, that uh, all there is to say, never mind trees and roots and leaves and all that nonsense that's there well, are that's a metaphor or, to help people understand. But it doesn't help because there's no leaves. Uh, what, what, what role does the leaves play in this? How do, how do we get the propositions into the leaves? It's not leaves. It's combinations of grounded categories that are named into propositions, definitions and descriptions, which, which in the end turn out to be all of a knowledge. I mean, what we're doing right now is... Um, exchanging categories. We're, we're um, exchanging categories because if we were not exchanging categories, we wouldn't be um, informing one another. I mean, I must, I mean, often I say th obvious things that you already know, but sometimes I say things that you didn't know, and that means I said a sentence, a subject and a predicate, that said something was the case, like all apples are red, right? And that's a categorization that I've, it means that the set of, uh, the, the, category of all things that are red contains the category of of apples what 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 the reference the kind of thing that apple stands for all of those things are parts of a bigger category namely things that are red if you didn't know that so mm -hmm. you're always getting categories from propositions sure even complex ones and that's what i mean to me that's the i've been puzzling about this for 40 years the the nuclear power of language is that the capacity to to um transfer 
to acquire and to transmit categories, the, instead of doing it the, the hard way that, that, that non-human animals have to use and that we use a lot, namely by trial and error and supervised learning, you can mm. say it verbally. You can literally put the two named categories together. And the only pe price you have to pay for that is the, ca the categories you use have to be grounded. And grounded means nothing more than that at some point down in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the grounding hierarchy, if you like, there's something that's sensory motor hmm. that well, you learn. Let, let, let's uh, use an example. I mean, you've used the example of mushrooms yep. before. Um, some, are, some are edible, some are poisonous, and some you must return you know, to back to the uh, environment. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, do you want to um, talk that about that That was sort example? of a trivial toy uh, example of what it is that grounding is. If you have a little sort of A-life creature uh, and you create a little environment for the A-life creature of things with different shapes, etc., in a mushroom world, uh, and as experimenters in this and the simulators are gods, they're the ones, if they're going to do, do supervised learning of mushrooms... They're the ones who decide which features make a mushroom edible and which ones make them inedible. They also put the features in. So you, so you have a little thing with a bunch of features, sensory features, let's say visual ones, uh, optical ones, and uh, you know, round, uh, square, big, small, et cetera, et cetera, all these features, things that the, um, that the transducers, the ones that, that pick up the, the input, can, can uh, transduce. And then you have a neural net after that that tries to find, with supervised learning, or, well, starting with unsupervised learning, tries mm -hmm. to find the correlations. This is the GPT-3 kind of part of it. Uh, first, in unsupervised learning, you just give it a bunch of mushroom inputs, and, and it just gets the lay of the land with mushrooms. It has no idea about edible or un inedible. And then... Um, supervised learning starts. You start. Supervised learning is why categorization, categorization is doing the right thing with the right kind of thing. Because now you've got right and wrong. You do something, you get feedback, and you say no. I'm, you, you get sick now because you ate a poison mushroom, etc. And then right. if and you're so lucky, so that becomes a rule, and that's the super. And that well, gets built into the supervised learning. It becomes a feature detector. A rule is. Well, I'll get to rules in a second. Uh, what it does, you know, the way that deep learning works. I mean, it's really just changing connection weights, and yeah. effectively, what it's doing is is filtering out features. So when you do supervised learning on a on a on a big uh, s s set of of um, inputs, and it's got to sort them into two piles if it's possible to do it by, by a means better than just memorizing them all, and that you couldn't do with their infinite piles, uh, there are some features that distinguish the members from the non-members. And the neural nets are really good at picking those up. They're good, good at doing the unsupervised learning, which is picking up the lay of the land. There they're really looking at what's correlated with what, just in the scenery, in the, in the, in the landscape. And then, once, the, once categorization comes into it, and, and there's a right and a wrong, they know how to calibrate what they've got and filter out the irrelevant features now. There's a lot of variation that was there that didn't know what to do with, and there were correlations in the variation. Filters out the irrelevant part and, and, and detects the relevant part. And then th this, the way this filter works is you're no longer seeing the irrelevant part. You're just seeing the relevant part. It pops out. Hmm. And so you it compress tells away the, the noise, the irrelevant stuff, and, and, and the si you're only seeing the signal, which is salient. Yeah, I don't know if I would call it compressing it away. I would say filter it out, but these are all just metaphors. Anyway, we know, this, we, the, we know how these nets work, and there are other, there are other uh, learning algorithms that are equivalent to these nets that work much the same way, uh, principal component analysis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so... In the end, what you have is a world with things. You have a categorizing organism that has to do some things with some kinds of things and some things with others. It has to figure out which kind is which. And in the end, it's doing the right things. But if it's, a, if it's an organism that can have language, one of the things it can do is to give it an arbitrary label, right? The name of the... I mean, you eat the mushrooms and you also call them mushrooms, Okay if it's a, a something that's going to scale up to language. And that silly toy pro problem just took it up one step. I mean, it was trivial. It went from just edible, inedible, which is 
nothing, to edible, returnable, markable. And there were two ways. Once you had learned the bottom level categories in this toy example, there were two ways you could learn the higher order categories, either the same way as you learned the bottom level, which is by supervised learning, or by instruction, which is to say, in this case, it's a simple conjunctive um, proposition. The, the um, returnable ones are the edible ones that are, I forget what, I found, what you had. What I said was that it couldn't, grounding couldn't end at the level of edible or inedible because then the, all you could do would be to, to, to uh, imitate what the people, who, what the creatures that knew it were saying in the presence of the mushroom. So when you have mushrooms there, and there's a, a, a creature that knows it and a creature that doesn't know it, the creature that doesn't know it can nevertheless find it out because the mushroom, the, the knower, is saying edible, inedible, edible, inedible, and so he's eating and then he, he can imitate. But if all of the uh, 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 creatures that know suddenly die out, you know nothing. It's not, that's not language. That's, that was, um, uh, Cangelosi and Parisi originally thought that that was what language was. It's not. What makes it language is the proposition. And, right? It's, it, it's, a, it's a combining these things and combining them out of stuff that you recognize with your eyes. Once you've got stuff that you recognize with your eyes and you know the name and you've got a bunch of things like that, you can make new things that are just combinations of the stuff you already know if you have names for the features as well. Because otherwise it's just extensional categories, you know. Um, what you want is not just extensional categories, which is the the round ones and the how shall I put it, uh, the, the carrots and the beans. Um, yeah, uh, a, a vegetable is a carrot, or a bean, or a or a or a, 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 or a Brussels sprout. That's an extensional category. It just gives you three ca says and it, you know t put together all of the Brussels sprouts, all the etc. But if it's features. In other words, everything that's green and 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 uh, and can be cut, then it's based on features and not on just putting together members of categories. And by the way, uh, uh, although I, all I can say is that um, that the grounding categories, whatever they turn out to be, and they're not identical from person to person, they're not all just concrete objects. It's not things like chairs, tables, and 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 mice. It's also features. And some of the features are really can be quite abstract. What, what, what does abstract mean? They can be quite high level. You can, at the at the grounding level, you may already be p picking up third order features and naming them, and you, because well, you need sharp them. might be a grounding sort of sharp, symbol. for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't. I'm not saying it is, but something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, but like just something like that because it's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, it's and dangerous, and it's it. and it's also a feature that a lot of things have. Yeah. And it's important, and so you want to say what? So, so y you know what a knife is, and you know what a razor is, and you but know what a prick uh, is, yeah, right, right, or a so, tooth or a claw, right, etc. <laughs> anyway, all so of you, this is you, all of yeah. This you don't is, need to know that they're tooth, claws, razors, knives. You just need to know that they're sharp and they can cut you. Yeah, yeah, right. Damn okay, I've been reading the Goethe discussion be, uh, since then, and I'm even less impressed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, this is all just uh, koans that, that you can make out of Goethe-like Go Go uh, uh, combinations. It's nothing. I mean, it's, it's, that's not... That's, he should go to a... Um, he should actually uh, go to the writings of, of um, mathematicians and logicians and see whether something that makes sense comes out of it for new questions. Because this is just gibberish. Oh, you, this is just yeah, stuff. You, you think it? You think that um, it might be able to sort of? Well, it can do maths and it can write programs. Yeah, and maybe I'd, I wouldn't be surprised if we yeah. could uh, prove some simple theorems. I mean, we already have theorem proving AI, yeah. so we could have. Yeah. But um, yeah, it would be if yes, Gödel is well, Gödel is paranoid, so he w he wouldn't be a good example. But for example, if there were enough writings from say Turing, there, there probably aren't. It would be interesting to ask uh, the Turing digester uh, questions that you would have liked to ask. For example, I would like to ask Turing, did you really mean that the Turing test had to be 
verbal and that it had to be done by computation alone, Turing computation? I, I, I don't know if I trust the answer because I would either say yes or no, but, uh, and, and, but, I, but I would still like to ask it, be it because I'm enough of a hermeneuticist that I can pretend that the word salad might contain some clues to something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, Leon, who knows? Um, maybe it will be an interesting intuition pump for a lot of people and they can bounce ideas off GTP3 um, and, yeah, come up with more ideas of their own. My prediction is it's gonna, they're going to get bored with it before that and that the only ones who are going to use it are the people that are going to abuse it, and they are going to abuse it. Because, mm. you know, there are people around on the planet who can't even recognize an obvious sort of mechanical computer thing, so you're going to be able to manipulate them, old people that you persuade to give you, give you their checks and things like that. Well, that, that I, I was just thinking of um, a use for it and for lonely people who don't have much to do um, you know, people in old people's homes who who their relatives don't come and visit them, maybe they want to talk to something. I mean, remember, children like uh, come transfixed by their dolls and carry them around and sort of project a sort of personality onto them. Yeah. So uh, maybe, maybe people will do that with uh, more sophisticated dolls uh, that sort of uh, are more like chatbot or sort of G... PT3 enabled. Yeah, no, no doubt. They did it with rocks. Why can't they do it with dolls? <laughs> you remember the pet rock era? I didn't have a pet rock. I remember people putting little eyes on rocks and calling them pets. Hmm. Yeah. I didn't do that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so um, where, where are we at? Where were we? Well, we, we did anti Andy Clark, and it ended up in GPT-3, mm -hmm. and then Goethe, and then symbol, symbol grounding to a certain extent. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought maybe um, we could discuss the contention between photos and Chomsky, Chomsky stuff, which sounded interesting. I'm not sure I've got my head all around it yet, but um, where to start? Vanishing... Intersections. Uh, it's not photo and intersections. It's not photo yeah. and Chomsky stuff because photo was yeah, a that's Chomsky. Photo was a Chomsky wannabe. Uh, Chomsky had syntax and it was a yeah, he invented a whole field, and syntax yeah, right. turned and, and then we had universal grammar. It turned out that mm. I don't think Chomsky. I don't know, because, but I don't think Chomsky went into it expecting this out, outcome. Uh, he was looking. He he suspected that there was that there might be some universal features that all languages shared, uh, mm. syntactic features, and he found them. But um, I don't think he expected that they would be unlearnable and that they would have to be innate. That I think he it was the data that forced that. So okay, so Chomsky's territory was universal grammar, which means yeah, syntax, exactly. syntax, and the poverty of the stimulus, which means you can't you can't learn it from the data that's available to the child. And I can and I'm I can simplify why you can't learn it, and why he concluded that it had to be innate. It was put the wrong way in the beginning because people mixed up universal grammar with ordinary grammar, which is learned and learnable. And so they said uh, they just mixed it all up. Universal grammar is very technical anyway. They said um, there isn't enough data in the language learning child. He doesn't hear enough. He doesn't get corrected enough. Etc. to um, to uh, learn universal grammar from that. It had to be innate. It's much worse than that. The child never says or hears a violation of universal grammar. Lots of grammatical violations, but not UG violations. I, I, in class, I call it UG and OG for ordinary grammar, okay? Um, mm. And people didn't make the UG-OG distinction. They just said, oh, yeah, uh, uh, the, the people that wanted to say uh, Chomsky was wrong, said, yeah, there's a lot that can be learned from the distribution of the words and, and uh, imitation and blah, 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 which is all true for OG. There's a lot of OG that can be learned by unsupervised learning, just from patterns. And there are other things that can be learned by supervised learning, because you make mistakes in OG and you get corrected. But with UG, the child doesn't make any mistakes, and adults don't make any mistakes. So they only get what's called positive evidence. They see that every every sentence in every every grammatically well-formed sentence in in uh, every language is ug compliant because ug is universal 
except for a few parameter settings. So um, that cannot be learned. It's like a category where you're trying to learn which ones are, uh, which are the edible mushrooms, and all I, all you ever see is edible mushrooms. Hmm. Well, what is their category? How do well, people learn well, that you need the, in order to make it a, of a category? Well, with mushrooms, it's it's absurd. But with UG, what it is is that linguists, since Chomsky, have been doing this by team. I mean, you can learn. UG is unlearnable to the child with the child's data, but it is learnable because because Chomsky and linguists are, are gradually crafting it together, and their method is very simple. It, it's um, they they hypothesize. A, a rule of UG. I said I would get back to rules, by the way. Um, uh, features are features. Uh, a, 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 dis a, def a des description or a definition is a rule. Okay? So if you say that, that, uh, that all uh, toadstools have white stripes and, and brown caps, right? That definition, description, that's a rule. Whereas a, a, a detector of white caps and, and, and stripes is just a detector of features. Mm -hmm. Right, so the neural nets are feature detectors. What you would need would be something much more sophisticated than the than the mushroom simulation I talked about, but that eventually can turn it into combinatory language. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so much for that. Um, what was I talking about? <laughs> oh yeah, so we were back in Chomsky. So. Um, Fodor. The reason I said Fodor was a Chomsky wannabe, because, <laughs> because Chomsky had invented this whole field founded on the fact that, um, that there was the poverty of the stimulus and that as far as UG learning is concerned, learning is trivial. It's not, there's no non-trivial learning going on over there. There are some parametric differences between Russian, German, etc. Some of them drop pronouns, some of them don't, some of them uh, use the, uh, the, the um, copula and some of them don't. So those are parameters, settings, but if they're settings on the universal grammar. Once you say you're speaking Russian, not English, then universal grammar takes its Russian form and there's no learning for universal grammar. There is for ordinary Russian grammar, but not for universal grammar. It's already there. The child, everything that the child says is compliant with it, which was enough to make people say, well, then maybe it doesn't exist, right? I mean, that's... Uh, uh, maybe what, it's just, universal grammar? Yeah. yeah. What, they, what, what they say is, well, maybe these are just things that linguists dream up. Well, let me tell you what the linguist methodology is. It's important to know. They're sitting around a table, although you really only need one linguist. You're going to be it's called primary, primary linguistic data or grammaticality judgments. What they do is they make a hypothesis, the way anybody would in any empirical era, area. Maybe this is the law of nature. Let's do an experiment to see whether it complies with this or it contradicts this. Well, they do it the same thing. They make a, a hypothesis about could, could this, could, um, I mean, I don't, I'm, I don't know this stuff technically, but could, could, um, could, uh, 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 I have, to use, I have to imitate their terminology. Could, um, uh, this is going to sound stupid and it's going to be in a, appearing in a video and I'm talking gibberish, but could there be a rule that, that in a tree structure where you have a subject and a, a noun phrase and a, and a, and a verb phrase, that, that when you go two, two rungs down in that structure, then, you, then, then things cannot re refer to anything that's not in their branch, Okay. Okay, mm. that, that would be a rule. That sounds hard to visualize, but yeah. Well, anyway, anyway it's a structure-based rule. So if there were that, you could, make a, you could make that conjecture, and then you say, okay, let's test it out. And then you can c create an utterance that, um, that conforms with that, and then you say, it, does that sound right or wrong? And if it sounds wrong, then you say, no, that's not a rule of universal grammar. It's wrong. It's a, they, they call them starred utterances. So you have two kinds of utterances, the ones that sound right and the ones that sound wrong. And we have this in ordinary grammar as well. You know, he ain't, what, he, he ain't do that. You know, that sounds right. We know why it's wrong, and we know why it's wrong, etc. We have rules. In universal grammar, they're trying to figure out the rules, right? And so they're using their grammatical locality judgments about what sounds right or wrong, because nobody ever speaks non-UG compliantly, and that's how they sort out what's a really a rule of, of universal grammar and what isn't. Okay? 
So that's the method of Chomsky. It's, uh, uh, he says, learning here is trivial. There's no, the child doesn't learn because they only get positive evidence. We're doing some non-trivial learning, we linguists, but that's because we're doing something different. So Fodor says, he, 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 the, the critique by Chomsky of Skinner, who thought that it was all just sort of reinforcement, etc., uh, supervised learning, if you like, really reinforcement learning, mm -hmm. um, and didn't understand the poverty of the stimulus. Uh, Fodor was saying it's not just true about syntax, it's true about concepts too. Concepts, just like universal grammar, are underdetermined. You can't learn them. And he gives examples like this. He says, what, what, what is a table? I mean, consider all of the thing, possible things. It's a little bit like Wittgenstein on rules. Uh, consider all of the things that a pa 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 table can be, how they can look. They can be made out of wood, out of etc., etc., etc. What do they have in common? His vanishing intersections is, if you look at all of the properties of all of the tables, you don't find anything that they ha all have in common. And that... And so there's poverty of the stimulus, therefore there has to be some sort of a uh, holistic uh, whatever. He, I don't even know what he wants to say. I mean, he, mm. he, he wants to Does say that... Does he believe that, if, that categories should only um, include things that are distinctly unique about each category? I think what, he's, what he wants to say is that categories, very hard. that categories are innate. Just the way you I mean, physicists would turn around and say everything's got something sort of that, you know, in, in, in common with something else. Everything's made of molecules, right? Or except energy, right? <laughs> um, and so, but, you know, a taxonomist may say that it's only um, the reason why categories exist uh, is because of the contingent salient distinctions between them. But they're contingent. Um, they don't have to be universal distinctions. Yeah, but that's the wrong analogy. It, uh, Chomsky is not interested in finding a universal grammar of concepts. Sure. He, yeah, he, but he's, so he's not saying all... Fodor was, right? Uh, but sorry, Fodor. Fodor isn't. No, Fodor, Fodor yeah. simply wanted to say that you can't learn concepts. You've got to know them already. It's a kind of a... Both of them are platonic in that sense. Not Cartesian, but platonic. But, uh, universal grammar is innate... And concepts are innate, whatever concepts means. I replace it by categories and I say, definitely not. Categories are not underdetermined. You don't just have positive evidence for categories. You have positive and negative evidence. That's how you learn what's right and wrong. So from the, from the outset, it's erroneous to say that, category, that if, if by concepts he means categories. If he did, concept is a weasel word. Everybody means whatever he means by it. It just means an idea. What on earth is a concept? But if you pin it down and say what you mean is a category, you know, apples, to, the kind of stuff you have in dictionaries and in encyclopedias defined and explained, those are concepts in their categories, then it's wrong. It's simply not true. C c categories are learned. Unlike universal grammar, they're learnable and they're learned. Mm -hmm. If not, you'd have to say that, that um, everything that anybody ever wanted to cate will ca has categorized or will categorize was all in your head all along. Right. Um, well, I guess there's some things which we didn't cover earlier on, and that is, well, how do humans actually learn new categories? Three ways, and then we've already yeah. mentioned it. One is by unsupervised learning. They are exposed to members and non-members without any feedback as to what's members or non-members, but they look at what's going on. So, for example, the example I use a lot, although it's not a good one, is mountains and valleys. Mountains are convex, valleys are concave, and then it may be the case, I mean, this is not true, but that, that in nature, mountains have white caps of snow and valleys have sort of um, uh, wet uh, bottoms, okay? Inverted so it, green, so there's a correlation bottom. between being convex and having a white top and being concave and having a, 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 a green bottom, right? Um, that could be picked up by unsupervised learning without knowing what anything is. It's just a correlation. Convexity, yeah, sure. it's a feature, co it's feature-feature correlations, really, and frequencies. Uh, we know that there are nets that are good at, at doing that, and, and in our experiments, they play a role, they, they, something like that. In fact, by the way, while we were talking, I received at last the email 
from my postdoc, uh, actually more than a postdoc, he's, a, he's, a, he's an associate professor, uh, who's finished our paper uh, on the neural net model that I've been waiting for for five or six months. So, and, wow. um, and he has a model for this. But anyway, it's, and it's, this, it's what I'm telling you now. So there's, there's the supervised learning, and then... When, if you're categorizing, you're going to have to also get into a phase where you have, uh, pardon me, unsupervised learning, that you have to have supervised learning. You have to be told what's right and what's wrong. So you get the lay of the land. You get what's correlated with what, but that has nothing to do with your categories. And then you start getting feedback on uh, when you're doing the right thing and the wrong thing. It's another correlation, but it's a, it's a supervised learning correlation. It's a correlation between doing the right thing and certain features and doing the wrong thing and, well, or do, and doing the wrong thing in the absence of those features, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the second way. So there's the, 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 uh, the way that you learn new categories is either through unsupervised learning just from correlations. The second way is through supervised learning by feedback, corrective feedback on what's what, and learning the correlation between the features and what you're supposed to do or not do. And then the so third... If you'd the, never seen a, um, a zebra before, but you've seen horses and you know what stripes are, you could be told what a zebra is. No, but that's the third way. Mm, yeah. That's not super unsupervised, and it's not uh, uh, it's not unsupervised it's not or super. supervised. It's it's learning by instruction verbally. It's basically yeah. Yeah. propositions, disc definitions, and descriptions that take already uh, grounded categories and put them together into a rule. So you know, mm. I mean, it's not true, but all. Uh, zebras are, they look like horses and they've got black and white stripes. And you know what black right. means and white means and horse means, so you've got zebra for free. So if it was like a mushroom and eating them was, I don't, we, we're not talking about eating zebras, licking them. If licking a zebra was, <laughs> was um, toxic, right? You'd, you'd, mm. you'd know, you wouldn't have to try it out. It's okay to lick horses, it's okay to lick donkeys, but not okay to lick zebras. You could be told. Mm. That's I the wouldn't third want to learn from experience. Probably <laughs> licking zebras. Um, no. I have to no. be careful because you know I used to use I used to use chicken sexing for my example. And yeah, I've, right. Yeah, I've, and yeah. I've completely abandoned that, and I feel ashamed that I ever did. It's one of the most mm. horrible things. Mm. Well, let's take the example of um, swans. If if you if you thought that one of the rules were all swans are black. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've gone from rule learning and then you come to Australia. Oh, sorry, all swans are white. And then you come to Australia and you actually see some black swans. You'd have to um, discard that rule, right? Right. right. And then and say, oh, oh, okay, from from experience, yeah, from unsupervised learning, I guess, you'd, you'd uh, throw out that rule. So That shows something that, uh, not from unsupervised learning, no. Uh, uh, from from supervised well, learning, supervised you you would have eaten the wrong kind, and you would have gotten sick, right? In Australia, no, yeah, excuse but we me. don't eat swans. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I mi mixed up the two examples. Uh, yeah, yeah, how would you know? Mushrooms. How would you know that it was a swan? I mean, it looks like a swan, and, but it's black, and all swans are white, so mm. it must be some kind of another creature. You'd have to have some feedback about the fact that it is a swan, but a, but, but even though it's black. And I, and I gave that example. Similarities or something. Yeah, that's what it would be, I suppose. Uh, it, it, we or have whether to they could breed. For example. Okay, let, right. So, so um, I used a similar example. I don't know if it was any of the things that you read, I, but I did it with mushrooms. I said when I was at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, a bunch of Russian emigres came. I wasn't in the Institute. My brother was in the Institute. I was in Princeton, or at Princeton. But... Um, a bunch of Russians were there, mathematicians, physicists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they were all great mushroom pickers. And they went out in the institute woods and 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 picked a bunch of mushrooms and then put it on the table and offered to us. And I said, "How? I I don't know anything about mushrooms, but how 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 do you know that these are edible?" He said, "Well, listen, we for years and years in Russia we've already been doing this." I said, "But how do you know that the lay of the land here in mushroom features is the same as in Russia. It's like your swan example. I mean, maybe the, a, 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 a fail-safe rule, I mean, a fail-safe feature in, Georgia, in Soviet Georgia doesn't work in U, U.S. Georgia because the, well, in the end, you know, categorization, even though it's absolute, it's either right or wrong, it's always 
compared to, I, I think I said that in one of the papers you read, the, the, the old state uh, uh, joke from Maine, a sexist joke, but I'll, I'll turn it into a sexless one now. How's your spouse? And compared to what? Compared to what? <laughs> I have to de ju I mean it's trivial I de-sex jokes but, but what's not trivial is getting rid of expressions like screaming uh, squealing like a stuck pig or um, uh, scanning a cat or something like that yeah, yeah sc right you can always it's got to be yeah, yeah it'd be nicer to sort of change the culture to remove sort of sex, sexist jokes and speciesist jokes as well yeah. yeah. Well, we we, that, we did. I mean, with 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 the uh, how's your wife was changed to how's your spouse, and now it's uh, mm. non-sexist. But anyway. Well, I was thinking about natural kinds and what philosophers of science, for instance, like to categorize as it, things that are useful to carve nature at its joints. Um, that is a natural kind, um, meaning that it corresponds to a category which reflects the structure of the natural world rather than imposed like structures that humans impose on nature. Like for instance, you could say that molecules are a natural kind because they're, they've got specific rules. Um, like a, a hydrogen atom has a certain structure and, um, and then molecules like oxygen have a certain structure and then iron has a certain structure and it's not arbitrary. Well, uh, but, but things like, a um, the difference between like, a a wolf and, um, a bloodhound or a hus more, more likely like a husky and, and a wolf. Some of those differences are quite. I'm not subjective. sure that the, I'm not sure that the natural kind philosophers would agree with that. In fact, I was just going to say, all right, a molecule is a natural kind, so is a monkey. Well, what counts is the difference between a monkey and an ape? There are. Uh, I don't know the details. I mean, I think uh, um, um, apes don't have tails, and uh, they have a different lineage. But, I mean, there there are differences, just like there are differences between uh, hydrogen and and uh, and uh, and uh, carbon molecules. I mean, no, I think but, that but the philosophers... But some monkeys don't have tails. Is that correct? Uh, some monkeys don't have tails. That's right. Well, that you find this often... Uh, what you need, you, the the reason you really need something that's more like a rule than a f just a feature detector is because because there's conjunctions and disjunctions, there's Boolean relations between features. So uh, to have a feature detector that picks picks it up directly, it would have to be in the form of a Boolean. It would be like a Google query that some things respond uh, that uh, uh, fall under and other things don't fall under but anyway i think maybe i'm wrong about this because I, I i never found it particularly useful but i think the category of natural kinds and the category of not natural kinds better examples of that are artifacts made by people or uh, uh, abstract properties that that people have picked out just because they're, they're they fancy it like what you said for aesthetic reasons or whatever that's the kind of stuff people give uh, as examples of non-natural kinds. Biological kinds, I think, are natural kinds, and I don't think anybody denies that. Hmm. Okay. Including, including, well, all right, uh, well, what will we do? See, the, uh, the idea of species seems to be like we've carved sort of categories there, but nature didn't do that. Um, in a, in, in, yeah, in but a there is a feature that distinguishes uh, m uh, members and non-members of a species, and you already mentioned it. Can they yeah. interbreed? Can they interbreed? Okay. Mm. So th that's a that's a real uh, feature distinguishing them, and it's a natural feature. It's not but something we've... it's a we've, blurry we've... feature. Um, like, for instance, you can mules, have three mules. different species. Yeah, you can have a species where, um, where you've got, like, three different sort of subcategories, like skink species a or skink version a can interbreed with skink version b skink version b can interbreed with skink version c but skink version a and c are too um, i guess far apart they can't interbreed but by transition do they belong to the same species 
or don't they? I mean, can you categorize A and B together, but not categorize B and C together? I see. I don't know whether I, you're you're making a valid point about uh, speciation and features of species. But I don't know if that's natural. That's that really cuts the same <laughs> cars, the same joints as natural kinds and non-natural kinds. I, I think uh, a, a prototypic. I hate prototypes, but but a prototypical non-natural kind is a chair. It has properties too, but it's properties that we've designed related to our bodies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, but I don't think I don't think the distinction between natural kinds and non-natural kinds is an ontological distinction. I don't think so. Well, maybe one thing is that you can't have transitory distinctions. Um, yeah. Anyway, so if you turn a chair upside down, is it still a chair if you can't well, sit on it? From the intentional it, it, stance, well, it's you can not. turn it. You can turn it upside down again, and then you can yeah. sit on it. So, yeah. you know, I mean, is a folding chair not a chair when it's folded? I mean, that's not. I don't. But, that but you really, can call a tree a chair, and all yes, you need you to can, do is just like you know, chop it down, and 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 then it becomes a stump, which can be used yeah. to sit on, and and therefore it's a chair. But you just or haven't even, turned it into a chair yet. Or even you can climb in it and sit on a bow, and then it's a chair. But yeah. the thing is that this comes back to uh, Wittgenstein on games, where, where he was trying to do something similar to what Fodor was trying to do with his vanishing intersections. He was saying, what's a game? And then you give a definition of a game, and then it's easy to find something that doesn't fall under that definition, but we agree it's a game. And it, and it looked to uh, uh, Wittgenstein as it was just about anything. And that's partly of what led him to that meaning is use nonsense if we decided to use it blah 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 but in the end of course um, what makes a category a category is that there's a right and a wrong it doesn't matter if the right and a wrong is natural in the sense that mushrooms will make you sick and 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 to toadstools will make you sick and mushrooms won't it could also be that trump is going to uh, ruin your business if you do this and not if you do or if you, on tuesdays Etc. Mm -hmm. So they can be, the the uh, the right and wrong can be uh, can be imposed on you by a dictator or by society or whatever, but the but the essential thing is that there has to be a right or wrong. If it's just a matter of degree, then it's not a category. So I think that um, the distinction between natural kinds and non-natural kinds. Well, I think it stems from the idea that people often thought that things had essences. Like, um, yep. you know, uh, lions had an essence and yep. there was some essential characteristic about a lion um, that made it a lion. Um, but then, you know, the evolutionist came along and said, well, was it a lion um, before it was, you know, let's just say lions actually evolved from a, a previous form of animal or a previous species. Where along that sort of evolutionary... Um, sort of gradients do you start calling it a lion and you stop calling it a saber-toothed tiger for want of a better um, but what you what example. you've shown is that that um if you look at it along a evolutionary line or something they just at some point there isn't a fact of the matter remember when we were talking about blue and, yet, and green i said that mm. uh blue is a different category from green but on the frontier you you don't there's no fact of the matter there's no you're wrong if you if you if you're in blue green mm. uh, it's not clear that you're wrong if you call it blue and, and right if you call it green but what if you call it a gru which is the green same same blue. same thing if there's a mm. distinction between a gru and a non gru you've got a category mm. so so some people people will uh, like when okay in the middle of the green sort of section people say hey yeah that's green or well, people who've under learnt the category of green in the middle of the blue sort of spectrum people say okay that's definitely blue but people would disagree upon where blue begins and green and green ends right. in the gradient the, between the, them the boundary is fu is is fuzzy and yeah. all that means is that you don't really have a category at the boundary it means that the distinction between blue and green is only where people can with 100% accuracy if you like say what it is and the and the consequences are right if they're and and that's all, maybe that's related to what people be, mean by natural kinds and um, artificial. I, I don't know. Well, you I think, could I say think I think people. It, it comes from yeah, essentialism in biology was one of the reasons why people started thinking about it. Perhaps 
Um, I've got yeah, a friend, maybe. John Wilkins, who's done a lot of research into taxa, and he, I guess he's an expert on taxonomy, and, um, and he should know, so maybe I should tap him on the shoulder and sort of interview him on these sorts of things too. <laughs> mm. Mm. I don't, uh, I, uh, c come back one day and tell me whether the distinction between um, natural and non-natural kinds turned out to be something that biologists had any use for. I have a feeling they don't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And essences are gone, okay? So, I mean, yes, there was a time when people uh, thought in terms of essences. In general, I think, s certainly in my field, in, in, in cognitive si science and psychology, as soon as a, a psychologist starts to do ontology, it's the, it's the same warning bell that I get when somebody comes in with a quantum model. It's, it's, it, it, turn, it usually turns out to be wrong-headed. Mm. We we are not ontologists, so if we talk about essences, we're we're in the we're in the wrong game. Go mm. talk to metaphysicians. Mm. Uh, where were we? Okay, so we're talking about like uh, evolution and why we categorize things. How much of our current behavior have homologs in the ancestral environment? Yeah, I I answer that in writing, mm. but I can give it to you again. Mm -hmm. uh, the the example I use is the one that everybody uses, which is uh, sugar, right? Why do um, kids have a sweet tooth? It's because, court, I don't even know if it's true, this story, but it's, a, it's a, a, a evolutionary psychologists love to use it, or at least love to use it until recently. Um, the idea is that in the original ancestral environment, sugar was rare, predators were not rare, but common. Kids are small and need energy to escape predators. So the kinds of kids in that ancestral environment that, uh, that would linger and eat sugar when it was available were more likely, if, they, if a predator showed up, to be able to get away than the ones who didn't care much for sugar. And so within a few generations or a lot of generations, you had only kids that had the sweet tooth because the ones that didn't have it... <laughs> Um, we're, we're ab adapted out, right? So then we get fast forward to now. The kids still have the sweet, sweet tooth. The predators are gone, and the sugar sure ain't rare, because, uh, who, the, 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 or if you like, there's a new kind of predator, and that's the commercial vendor of candies, etc., <laughs> yes. etc. Et they put it on every corner, and so kids are now getting fat, hyperactive, high, uh, tooth decay, diabetes, uh, obesity, etc., all kinds of things because of the sweet tooth. And you asked me how, um, yes, there are homologs and there are, things have changed. The, pred the old predators are gone, the sugar isn't rare, the sweet tooth is still here, and um, and 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 kids are still eating, but it's not the the diabetes is, is isn't enough to kill them off the way it killed off the ones that were indifferent to sugar in the ancestral environment. That's right. So I mean, so it persists. predators, the, the 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 current predators aren't actually preying on the people's flesh; they're preying on their income, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's so but it's their it's their the pre candy predation. Is the lure. It's their predation that's causing the obesity, the the tooth decay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but Mm. but they're not killing them. Well, you, you have that kind of predator, too, that just takes a bite and goes away. So, so there are some things that have homologs in the uh, ancestral environment, but can all our behavior relate directly to homologs in the ancestral Definitely environment? Definitely not, because there's, there's one point you asked about, where, where does it get absurd? What, what, mm. uh, there's one point at which there's a, a real discontinuity. It's not that communication began with humans, because there's all kinds of nonverbal communication brilliant nonverbal communication among among other species but linguistic communication is unique i don't know if chomsky's right about universal grammar probably is but uh but what's certainly true is the first two ways of of acquiring categories unsupervised and supervised we share with all other species but the capacity to acquire them by by verbally is uh, exclusive to us and mm -hmm. that's that's a huge difference. And a lot of the stuff, you ask, what did it all originate back there? A lot of the stuff was created because of our verbal capacity. The verbal capacity originated there, but once we have it, we can pick it up and run with it, and then all bets are off. And these evolutionary psychologists who are thinking in terms of spiders and sex, 
have just left out the the most human characteristic from it. And in fact, no, you mentioned, uh, because I mentioned it, um, you mentioned that there's some really trivial evolutionary psychology theories about the origin of language, like the one about uh, it's a way to chat up um, birds. Women. But yeah, birds is the is the uh, is the equivalent, uh, the the vulgar equivalent of chatting up. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. So examples of ex- selective behaviour that that works, and you gave the example of a a peacock's tail that that controls for cheating, for instance. It's hard to fake a healthy peacock tail in a male. But if if the display mechanism that made males attractive to females was very simple, then um, and easy to fake, Indeed. or yeah, yeah, like for instance, just a little dot on the head, you'd you'd have evolution coming up with cheating strategies or camouflage yep. strategies, or yeah. What Dawkins used the dot for was something slightly different, but it's the same idea. He oh, okay. said he said the it dot the on the forehead. Yes, but it was used in a different context. It wasn't about, um, it was about cheating, but it was not about attractiveness cheating, sexual attractiveness. It was about relatedness cheating. Sure. I'm your relative, be good to me, because I'm where you see I got the dot, and that's our family dot. That could be invaded easily. Yeah. So the idea that something very simple, uh, but there are species out there that like, uh, seem to have very simple adaptations to make them look non-edible like certain forms of butterflies or insects. Yeah, well, like. the way it works is that you have some bright-colored frogs that are that advertise the fact that they're poisonous. I mean, they, they, they really are poisonous. You bite them. And then you have imitators who also... But they're not competing with the... That's a... Bio, that's a... You know, the distinct, we, there's a distinction made between an evolutionarily stable and an evolutionarily non-stable strategy. Strategies. The the uh, the butterflies that imitate the the um, poisonous butterflies are not competing with the poisonous butterflies. So it's it's a stable strategy. They're 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 it's it's camouflage basically. And the same with the frogs. Right? So it's not it it would become a cheater strategy if they were competing with the poisonous frogs in some way by imitating them. Right. Well, what about parasitism? What about I mean, it? let's let's have a look at cuckoos, for instance. They invade other birds' nests. Some of them learn to nudge other eggs out of baskets, but the parents keep on feeding them. Um, and yeah. they got really big mouths, and so, yeah. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's a... Uh, that's a st- that seems to have been a, uh, sometimes parasitism is evolutionarily stable. Uh, I mean, obviously, if it was too good, then there'd be no more there'd, there'd be no no other species of bird to do that with. Hmm. So it's, it's just uh, I think um, yeah I don't know I'm not the fact is that I'm not a biologist so I don't hmm. uh, I I don't know what the limits are on on parasitism and invasion. Yeah, I guess. If there's a, a way for parasites to get away with it without disrupting the, um, I guess, the stable strategy too much, then it will. Until That's what such they aim for. Is That's what they aim for. And there's may, similar questions being asked about viruses and in particular about COVID. Mm. Uh, if COVID, uh, well, if COVID kills off its host before it's had a chance to repro- reproduce, then that's bad. So I guess parasites and viruses and bacteria must come uh, look for something that at least serves their ends before uh, they burn their candle down. I, I guess it would be interesting to see if there were examples of ecosystem collapse, m- micro ecosystems uh, within certain environments that were caused by parasitic behavior. So collapses, I, don't, I haven't really done any research in this, but it, it could be interesting. Neither have I, but it's, I'm the wrong person. For, this is not good <laughs> questions to ask me. Okay. All right. Okay, so another question is, do you think our capacity for generalization came before our ability to, to have universal grammar? Why would it, you ask that question? Well, because I'm interested in AI. 
<laughs> yeah, but what has uh, universal grammar got to do with generalization? I mean, well, without the without generalization, without the ability to sort of think outside of, I guess, evolved and instinctual responses to to things. Look, we evolved the capacity to learn. There's generalization there already. If you if you if a Skinner box teaches you that you should press the lever on the left whenever you're hungry, you generalize that. It's not just right now that it's going to work. It uh, just keep doing it, okay? Mm -hmm. And when you're ca learning categories by by finding features, abstracting features, abstraction is already categorization is already generalization. What it's saying is that I'm looking for. Uh, invariant features that are always there in the members and absent from the non-members. So I can generalize. I can have. I can take. I. I'll, I'll detect those features, and it's going to work for things I've never seen before. Okay. Hmm. So it's in. Tra it's a, uh, generalization is implicit in that it has nothing to do with universal grammar because according to the story, universal grammar is not learned. It has something. To, if you like ordinary grammar. Uh, has this as well. We generalize in ordinary grammar, pl plurals, uh, agreement, etc. But mm. but 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 general. But it, it's it's important to understand that the that learning itself, and especially category learning, is the mother mm. of all generalizations. The ability to to have general language probably came after our ability to to generalize. But I guess. I don't know if generalization just sprung out of nowhere. There must have been a primitive forms of generalization that sort of got better and better. And but once we no, developed... What I'm, what I'm suggesting is that it's implicit in learning. What you mean by learning is from examples to be able to be, handle stuff you haven't seen before. The way it always works in machine learning, for example, is you have a training set mm. and a test set. And that's the test set is the, t the test of whether you've found the right algorithm so that it's going to work on stuff you haven't tried before and that's what generalization is now that's in machine learning but in ordinary biological learning ordinary um, um, skinnerian learning reinforcement learning, it's the same thing right you get you get you you uh, you pick up some uh, c correlations between doing something with some kinds of things and getting a reinforcement and doing something else with other kinds of things and getting a reinforcement and then you can do it with new things that you haven't uh, tried before, and then you've learned it. If it's if not, you're still in the re learning phase. If if the if the um, reinforcement contingency that you picked up doesn't work for new cases, it's the wrong contingency, or, or it's not enough. But it's implicit in the very th notion of learning, and learning precedes um, humans. I mean, I, I, uh, of course, yeah. So, it's already there. So, I mean, it's, the thing that you're looking for is, is one of the properties of learning. What would learning, be, what does, what would learning mean if it didn't mean being able to generalize from the training such stuff uh, to, uh, to, to everything else? Well, there well, what, what there's some learned? animals that, that uh, don't adapt well outside of their environments. If you take a beaver and put it in a desert, it's not going to survive very long. But you take an animal like a human out of the African savanna and put it near an ice glacier, it'll probably start trying to build an igloo or something, some equivalent. Or, yeah, it can yeah, adapt its environment. That, yes, but that's sort of anthropocentric because I think that you could show the same thing with some... Look at all of the invasive species that manage to... Uh, like well, cane toads there. in Australia and rabbits in Australia, for right, sure, right. yeah. So yeah. fine. So we're not unique in that either. And we can't adapt to everything. And by the way, no. we're on the verge of something that we probably can't ad adapt to and serves us well. Hmm. Well, you, you talk about COVID-19 or climate For change? For example, things like that. Climate change and, uh, uh, and or, because they're related, um, uh, zoono zoonotic um, disease. Yeah. Another thing you spoke about was grounding sets, like the set of words which can be said to be generated by sensorimotor grounding capacities alone. So how many words do people typically ground by means other than uh, their dictionary? I, all I can them? tell you is what all I can tell you is that when we analyze dictionaries and it's it, you may want to know how we do it. Mm. Um we, we started out with uh, a, 
a dictionary that supposedly had already done it. It was for foreigners, and it supposedly defined everything in the dictionary in terms of uh, a reference set of 3,000 words, but it didn't. Uh, we were working with mathematicians. It was clear that there were exceptions. There were words that were that were used to define that hadn't been defined, and vice versa. So, so we settled because the mathematician said, look, I, I can't work with this kind of fuzzy stuff. What do you mean by a dictionary? And so we settled on the fact that a dictionary is a set of words in which every single word in the set is defined by a, set, a string of words. And there are no words that are not defined, and there are no, no right, basically, there are no words that are undefined, and everything is defined, and it's all defined in terms of the, right, okay. So if that's a dictionary, and that's what the dictionaries are, then... Um, we should be able to find the grounding set without believing uh, the maker of the dictionary who says, I d define them all in terms of these 3,000 words. So we did. We took big dictionaries and we removed uh, words that didn't define any further words. For example, pterodact pterodactyl, right? The, the flying dinosaur. That's defined, but as far as I know, nothing else is, determined, is de defined in terms of something that includes pterodactyl, okay? So that's an end point. So you pull that off. And then you still have the, dic the rest of the dictionary, but you say, I don't need that because I can reach it from what I've already got le left. And you keep on paring things down like that until you finally end up with what we call the, the, nu the nucleus of the dictionary, which is about 10%. Uh, but that's not what we're looking for, because the nucleus of the dictionary is as far as you can get. If you, if you try to p pair off more words than once you've got to the nucleus, then you lose some words. So you, you basically can't define everything anymore. So we can't take out any more words from that and still have a dictionary, because what's left, a nucleus is still a dictionary. Okay? Um, what's in the nucleus? Well, it turns out that inside the nucleus is another thing, a very big structure, we call it the core, it's a dictionary too. But unlike the nucleus, which can define everything inside itself and everything outside that we've already picked off, the core can only define everything inside itself. It's still a dictionary, so, but, but it can't go any further out. And around the core are these little, uh, what we call them, satellites, which is tiny never mind their properties, they're, they're tiny clusters of words. And the way, um, and so, so neither the nucleus, nor the core, nor the satellites is what we're looking for. The min minimal grounding set is something different. The bad news was that in a connect, connected graph where you define every word, uh, where every word that defines a word is connected with, a, with an arc, with a, with a, with connection to, so you have a, a, a connected graph with defining words pointing to defined words, and that's the structure of the graph. Well, we've shrunk down the graph to the core, uh, to, the, to the nucleus. In the nucleus is the core and the satellites. Where are the minimal grounding sets? A minimal grounding set is the smallest number of words with which you can define all the rest by combinations of them. It's not mm -hmm. the nucleus, it's not the core, it's not the satellites. And there are lots of them. In, they're all in the nucleus, mm. but there's lots of them. And, and, but, but, they do, but there are minimal grounding sets in the sense that there is, there's, this, there's a smallest number, and they're all, there's a whole bunch of them that are equal to the smallest number. The mm. problem of finding it turned out to be NP-complete. So in general, for a, gra a directed graph, you cannot find, this is called the minimal feedback vertex set, you cannot find it because it's NP-complete. You know what that means, right? Uh, you, you have to compute till the end of the universe yeah, and you still right. don't yeah. get it. Okay, so, but there is a way to do it in dictionaries with the special features of dictionaries and with some tricks. And we found them. And we found that inside the nucleus are many, 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 many minimal grounding sets. All of them are part core and part satellite, but they differ. Some of them just differ, differ trivially, one word, two word differences. Some of them are more different. We're still mm. studying that structure, but we know what the size of the minimal grounding set is. It's, about, it's depending on the size of the dictionary, but somewhere between um, 750 and 1,500 uh, 1, words, somewhere in that order, maybe bigger for some monster big dictionaries. 
So they're very small. And on the face of it, if by some means or other, never mind the lab with the category learning, etc., et if somehow you could give somebody into their heads as a gift the meaning of those 1,500 words, then you could get the rest of them by definition. We know that. We know mm. you can do that. Mm. Uh, we also know that the, the words in those minimal grounding sets are uh, learned younger, they're yep. more frequent in the language, and... Well, that, that's as much as I would put my hand on. There's also something to do with abstractness, concreteness, but it's not clear. It turns out that since every minimal grounding set is part core and part satellite, uh, there's some differences between the satellite layer and the core layer. The satellite layer ha is more abstract than the core. Mm -hmm. So there's and that's, and that's not a, everything else. Uh, age of acquisition goes as you go from the periphery, the things you, you pterodactyl. As you go all the way d right to the middle of the core, everything gets younger. Everything gets more frequent. But for abstraction and freak, uh, abstra abstractness is a strange thing. You've already shown it with your question mm -hmm. about generalization. It's not clear what it means. Is is something? I have to concrete. say, I, was, I learned early what the names of many of the dinosaurs were um when i was in primary school <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an outlier so <laughs> no, so no probably not because kids well, anyway i'll tell you what the obvious conclusions you would want to draw from this are all wrong hmm. it's not true that a child learns 1500 words and and the rest of them is done by definition hmm. uh, learns directly grounds 1500 words uh, probably they ground much more than that, and they keep grounding things for the rest of their lives. We all do. We don't get things purely by by words. Um, but um, in principle, it's true. And yeah. maybe you need more grounding than the absolute minimal one, maybe a lot more. Maybe you need redundancy. And also, not everybody has the same grounding set necessarily. I, mean, I may be grounded on a slightly different... Uh, set than yours. The way I think of it is kind of like uh, basis sets for vector space. You know mm -hmm. that? Um, for an n-dimensional oh, vector Oh, yeah. Pardon right. me? I know what vector spaces are. I don't know. So, so, uh, so an n-dimensional ve ve vector space, n, n, in a finite n-dimensional vector space, the, the number, the, the, any... N, it's, we know that we can get all of the points in the vector space from, from the Cartesian coordinates, uh, x, y, z, p, q, etc., all of those. If you had all n dimensions like that, then every point in the n-dimensional de 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 vector space is a, has a value on each one of those dimensions, right? So, so it, uh, in a three-dimensional space, right, in three space, there's a point, uh, two one minus one, which is two along the x-axis plus two, uh, two, one on the y-axis and minus one on the z-axis, and that's a point. And every point has that, mm -hmm. and it's all that's a right. combination of three, three vectors. Uh, one vector is one, zero, zero, the other one is zero, one, zero, and the third one is one, zero, zero. You take m linear combinations of those and you can get any point. Well, in I think it's something. Yep. Right, and and for an n n dimensional space, it's for n, and the basis is n. If you like, the minimal grounding set for a an n dimensional space is n, and they don't mm -hmm. have to be orthogonal ones, zero, zero, zero. They could be any any that are not on the same line. Any n linearly independent points will do it. So maybe it's like that with semantic space as well. That that you don't have to have the same minimal grounding set, right? You just have to have the mm -hmm. approximately the same size one, and there's lots of ones that'll g generate all of all of the dictionary and all sure. potential meanings for you. Sure. Well, I mean, like I'm thinking of how this could be practically useful, and one of the things is if we wanted to inform strategies for early childhood education and the types of words we should be focusing on getting them to to become more familiar with. That could be useful, but also... It could be. It could be, and that's the kind of fake stuff that we put on our grant applications, but it's not true, because I just told you that mm. there are tons and tons of minimal grounding sets yeah. in the nucleus. The nucleus is 10% of the dictionary. You can't say... And, and, the, and, the, and so there are 1,500... Uh, 
sets of 1,500 words inside the 10%, which is way too big, that will all work. Okay, so which one are you going to teach the kids? Hmm. And why? Hmm. Hmm. So it's not, it's not what you would think. But there, there, is, there, is, there is one interesting thing that I forgot to tell you. It's conceptually worth knowing. I told you that the nucleus is a dic- the dictionary is a dictionary, and we've defined a dictionary as a bunch of words where every word is defined by words in the set and there's nothing undefined, etc. Uh, the dictionary is a dictionary. The nucleus is a dictionary. The core, and the nucleus is a dictionary and can define out and in. The core is a dictionary, but it can only define in. What is the minimal grounding set? Hmm. It's not a dictionary at all, because it can't define in. It can only define out. It's not a dictionary. The words in in the minimal grounding set are undefined. It's a grounding set, right? So it, it can't define any of its words. It just takes them, give me my 1,500 words, and I'll take care of the rest. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, and that's what we're talking about here. But you, Interesting I mean, like, pro- you may not know exactly what the words are, but um, given rules, you could define that, like you could have an informed opinion on what kinds of words they are. What you should be able to do with a minimal grounding set is you can use them in combinations to build up all the rest of the dictionary and then come back in on the words that, right? Using your grounded words, you can go back and, and define the, 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 the using your, your uh, um, combinatory words, the ones that you reach by combinations, to go back and define the ones that, the grounding words. But that's cheating. It's a big circle. It's like saying, I can define, in our dictionary, we have a, we have a dictionary game where we have people, um, they're given a start word and they have to define the word and then they have to define the words they use to define the word and so on and so forth and, and the, until they close the dictionary. And, the, and the, the goal is to close it with as few words as possible. And of course, people cheat. I'll tell you how, how you can cheat. You can define a whole dictionary by saying, Big, that means not small. Small, that means not big. It's, mm. a, it's a dictionary, you know. All the words are there. They're defined by the words in the dictionary. Uh, so what we do in the game is we say, in order to play this game, you have to have at least three content words. Content, I, I, in, in the stuff I wrote to you in the document, I define content words and, and uh, function words. Function words are things like if, then, is, not, etc. There, there, and there's a finite number of them, and they don't have reference. You don't say, "What's it? Where's? Show me an if, or show me a not." They're just functional. But all the rest of the words, 99.99 percent of the words in the dictionary are content words, nouns, adverbs, adjectives, uh, etc., which are names of categories, mm-hmm. and so they can be combined. Well, what we require in the in the in the in the game. computer game, get dictionary game, is that you have to, for every definition, you have to use at least three content words. Okay. At least, uh, this, you can still cheat. You can make it into a bit, all dictionaries are circular, so you can make it circular, even a uh, game dictionary, even that way. But it's starting to get far enough out so that the idea is that you should give a dif- definition that will actually work for somebody who doesn't know what this means. Uh, and obviously, if 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 you say big is not small and small is not big, that's, that's not going to help. That's only using one function word. So, what's an example of a non-cheating? Uh... Yeah, one thing that we often use is clock as an as a start uh, a startup word. Right. Okay. By the so... way, this is online. Yeah. You know, what I suggest you do is go there and try it. Uh, right. So where? So, but the punchline is that all dictionaries are circular because right. of the grounding problem. Okay. Right. So they all depend on some some stuff that that you know some other way, and we just think the other way is uh, sensory motor category learning. Okay. I asked the question: Are most of our words first learnt through verbal means? And of course not. No. Yeah. So, um, what kinds of words are better learned through sensory motor grounding versus? Well, I can't um, answer verbal. your question. I can't answer your question because we've been looking. The reason, one of the reasons we're doing the uh, computer game is because it's uh, the, the dictionary game is because it produces smaller dictionaries. I don't know if they, they, they have all the properties we need, but in all the big dictionaries, regular ones that we did, there's too many words in the grounding set 
for being able to get answer questions like that. There's all kinds of words, and, and, and since there are many different grounding sets, you know, some of them are very different from others, even within the same dictionary. So I don't know. Hmm. Uh, and it's certainly not something as simple as that they're concrete things that you can touch with your hands and see with your eyes. There's some hmm. like that, but there are also features that are, that are much more abstract than that hmm. Hmm. early on. Early on, and th- we have uh, corpuses that tell you what the age is that, that children first say these words or the, when they first hear these words, and, it's, and, it's, um, and these, are, e- these are words that, are, that start very early. Sure. But yeah, let's talk about why the hard problem is hard. So why do you think it's insoluble? Well, I'll get to At insoluble. At least the, the, feel, I, I, the feeling section is yeah. insoluble. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that is it. I mean, it is not the feeling section. That's what the, the hard problem is. It's uh, Okay, so let's start with the easy problem. Mm. Uh, cognitive science is working on the easy problem. How and why do, can organisms do all the things they can do? That's the easy problem. Right. And that's Turing's problem. The hard problem is how, and by the way, how and why there means how causally, what kind of a causal mechanism can generate this capacity, and why is partly that too, and partly also uh, evolutionary. Why? What is this? Why? Do, what is this capacity for? Okay, that's the mm. easy problem. Yep. The hard problem is how and why do organisms feel? Okay, mm. and why is it hard? Well, one thing, the easy problem, what they can do, you can see, right? Whereas with uh, what whether they, what they feel and whether they feel that's the that's that's not what, that's the other mind's problem. It's not the hard problem, but it's it means it's not observable. You can't observe feeling. You can observe doing, but you can't observe feeling. You can observe structure. I mean, what they look like, what they're made out of, and what they're doing. All the Turing tests you can do. Turing is based on the easy problem, but you can't observe feeling. And Turing suggested just give up. You know, just leave it alone. It's not. It's not something you can uh, get at empirically, and besides, um, if something passes my Turing test, and you really can't tell it apart from a person, then um, then you don't have any reason to any more reason to doubt that it feels than you have to doubt that I feel or you feel. Okay, but the reason it's hard, and the reason I think it's imp- insoluble, is because is it's because of the easy problem. It's because the easy, from a Darwinian point of view and from a mechanical causal point of view, the easy problem has already answered all the questions. Once you explain how an organism can do everything it can do, right? If then you say, okay, fine, but 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 we have reason to believe they also feel. How and why do they feel? Um, every attempted answer to that question draws on what it can do. You say, you, you, you say, well, if it didn't feel, this would happen, or it couldn't do this. And then, the, and then of course, immediately the, sh- the theorist says, no, no, we've already handled that. We've explained how and why it can do everything it can do. Feeling seems to be superfluous causally. Of course, it can't, that can't be true. I'm not a mysterian. I'm sure, uh, as I'm of anything, that feeling is a, is, a, is a genetic and a neurological p- property. There's something in the brain that generates feeling. We don't know how. And there's a reason it's doing it. But an adaptive, by reason is adaptive, so, uh, by, by Darwinian. We don't know what it is. Every hypothesis that we have for what it might be is spoiled by the fact that, hang on, you say that the reason we feel pain is because if we didn't feel pain, then we would touch, burn. Did we discuss this already? Then we would be tusk- touching hot surfaces and not pulling away our hands. But then mm-hmm. the answer is the uh, the easy problem says, pull. You know, when when a, when a when you when you uh, touch a hot surface and you you should learn <laughs> that um, the hot surfaces are da- cause damage and uh, the the hand should be withdrawn by the mechanism that 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 makes it possible to learn this at all. Right, the right thing to do is to pull away your hands. Mm-hmm. Why should it feel like something? What's the point of hectoring you with the feeling and going through the loop of sort of get, doing the input and then, and then asking some homunculus up there, may I have permission to pull, pull away my hand? Mm. With, besides the fact that in the case of burning, we know that the, the hand is pulled away before you even feel it. 
Yeah, so appealing to homunculus is, is an infinite regress because you'd still have to answer the question of the homunculus. And in this case, it's why, yeah, what's going on inside the homunculus and why is it there? I mean, why mm. cut, out, cut out the homunculus and do what needs to be done? Mm. The answer will have to be, if there is a solution, it has to be something that the stuff that we can do couldn't be done without feeling. But nobody has a clue of a clue. All I have is bad theories of what that is, like um, the, the stupid one that says, well, if you didn't feel it, we wouldn't pull away our hands, which is nonsense. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Have you heard of the Hogan sisters? No. Conjoined Siamese twins, yeah. uh, they have some form of thalamic bridging going on between their brains. So they're individual people, but they're mm -hmm. sharing part of their brain. And so what happens? Like, you know, one of them seems to... There's an <coughs> object out of sight from one of the sisters, one of the sisters' eyes... But they could, but with her hands, she can seems to lean over and grab something like a block, without seeing it with her own eyes. So she seems to be getting stimulus from the her sister's eyes, and reportedly, when one's feeling sad, the other one also feels a bit sad. But you could say that's you know part of the result of um, yes, I but guess the, the, the chemicals ask, flowing around the body. No, but the know. question. Fine, let's let. I'm I'm willing to take that all as face value. But the question is this: when one of them feels sad, the other one also feels sad. But they're mm. they're not feeling one another's feelings. They're feeling mm. their own feelings. There's two people there. I went in the cognitive. I think it was in the. I forget what paper I discussed. Signed to Siamese twins and and uh, various kinds of connections you could have. In the end, it's the same as the migraine criterion, right? The, 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 the entity, the, the, the migraine can't be wider than a head, and if you have two Siamese twins with, with two, two half heads, right? I mean, by the way, you have the same story with the... Uh, well, they share some of the, they share parts of the brain. That's fine, so there'll be causal connections, but they're, not, but they're still not feeling one another's feelings as long as there's two of them. If they, felt, if they really were feeling the same feelings, there would be one. It would be a two-headed person, the feeling, right, one two-headed person. It's not. I guess, I guess this is a problem with identifying them as distinct, unique individuals there because there's shared aspects of no, what we would isn't. normally call, what we'd normally use to describe an individual they have shared aspects. They have shared shared parts. If you are your brain, are you your brain? Uh, what are you? If you're not your brain, what, what, how would you describe I, I, it? It's the wrong question. Because what is it? Because the, the you, you is a kind of a theoretical thing. When I feel something, when I'm in a state of feeling, is it generated by my brain? Of course, just by my brain. Hmm. Identifying That's the only them as yeah, well, this is this is the reason why I don't like cogito. I think, therefore, I am. I'm blah 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 blah. This is why I say the right insight is I feel. Therefore, 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 feeling is going on. That's all. Hmm. So, if there is centers, if there's aspects of the brain which generate feeling, um, could they generate it for more than one identity? It, it, so some of the Siamese twin stuff could potentially do that, where you have one generator, and then it obviously it can't. If the generator itself were the were the feeling state, then it couldn't, because that it would be it would be generating a, fe, a, fe, a feeling is such that it has to have a feeler, right? I mean, feelings are felt. Unfelt feelings, that's why I got rid of the, the Freudian stuff yet when we were talking yesterday. Is unfelt feelings is not feelings at all. Uh, that's not mental. That's just stuff. But, f or, and, and, if, and you know, I went outside and I didn't feel cold. That's an unfelt feeling. I didn't feel cold, right? But that's just a play on words. So feelings have to be felt. There's something about feeling that's both subject and object. I agree. But how many subjects, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the same feeling can only be felt by one feeler. When, when, two, when two people are taking acid and looking at it, hey, man, you see that? <laughs> they're not really having the same feeling. Mm -hmm. They're not sharing the same hallucination, right? Right. Well, all right It'd be yeah. interesting if they did, right? 
<laughs> the, um, it, it, I don't. How would you know it? And what, what does it mm, mean? I mean, mm, uh, for mm. the only ones who share the same. <laughs> this is related to the philosopher's problem of the identity of indiscernibles. Uh, if two things are identical, then there's nothing you can do to tell them apart. They're just one thing. Well, so, there's no two things. There's no. There's no tokens of any category that exists in the physical world which can be called identical because they they exist in different positions in the universe yeah and it, I, this I, only well, works in logic yeah but it's true about well yes and no uh, uh, is an instance of one the same as another instance of one what i mean i don't even know what that means it, well, this it, is just logic, because logic is, is, is just logic space. But, I mean, you know, that only exists as a tool for us to use to yeah. make sense of the world, right? Yeah, we shouldn't go there, actually. It's formal. It's just <laughs> symbol, symbols for symbol manipulation. We don't have to talk yeah. about existence there. But, <laughs> but what I want to say is that the, the, the identity of indiscernibles is somehow related. The, 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 the fact that it's empty or self-contradictory to talk about two different things that uh, sh that share all properties and they're still not the same thing it doesn't and you've already given one example spatial distinctness but that's just one example I mean any and any way that you pick out I mean you could be talking about you could be talking about properties of a thing rather than and and you can instantiate the properties you can say uh, the color is a property, and the size is a property, etc. So, can there be two properties of the same thing that are not ident that are that are that are not the that same right. property? I mean, yeah, I mean, sure. The thing well, is, well, in the well, remember the pro the properties are the symbols that we're using to describe the phenomena. Um, correct. Well, no, so, the properties are not symbols. The properties are properties, right? I mean, uh, size is a property of, I mean, I'd say color, not, not color, uh, shape is, the, is a property of an object, okay? That's the proper, so it's a physical property. It's not a symbol, hmm. right? I mean, something is round, okay? And it's also red. So uh, those are two properties of the same thing, but they're not the same property. Could you have two distinct properties that are otherwise identical they're just distinct properties but they're identical in every other respect no they would be the same property and it's not because of space it's because anything any allegedly two things that are identical in every respect are not what they're alleged to be <laughs> they're one thing and i think there's might be some relation uh, to uh, to, uh, to uh, sentience to feeling in that as well the nature of feeling is such that it's felt and can the same feeling be felt by two, literally the same feeling by two different feelers? No, I think that gets as ridiculous as, as the uh, distinctness of uh, uh, the, the, the non-identity of etc. But I don't know, I can't... I so, 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 so you're saying that, that properties, you know, because it's up to us to define how we measure things and, and the measurement that we give things is, is to me sounds like what, what you're describing as a property. So size, we, we, we can say, okay, well, a, a tower has a, a size property. You could say that that's, yeah. But th th this, this is something that we impose on it. I mean, the universe doesn't say it's got a size, yeah. it just does. I broke my rule. I shouldn't have, we're now going into ontology and I, this is what I said we should renounce. Okay. Renounce ontology. <laughs> well, I do, if, if we're, unless you're a philosopher or a metaphysician, it's your... your well, what your, do you mean by ontology? Isn't ontic space Let's not what's talk real? about what, what exists. No. I'm a, I'm a psychologist, I guess, in the end. So I'm interested in what it is that organisms can do and mm. the fact that they feel, but nothing else. I'm not talking about what's real, what's not real, what exists, what doesn't exist. I, I, I'm, I'm a naive realist in that way. We have a planet here with little creepy things that are on it that, that move right and, uh, but surely what's real should inform what psychologists think about what's real I don't think they have to even raise the question just go with naive realism there organisms are what they look like and they're on this earth and the earth really ex is really there <laughs> and, well, and, and Siamese just, twins are real yeah Siamese twins are real and we can ask and the questions Hogan of, sisters are real 
and we can ask the question, does it make sense to surmise that the that two of them are feeling the same feeling? Not mm. a similar feeling, but literally mm. the same feeling. And mm. I think that mm. there's something there that's incoherent. Sure, sure. I mean, it'd be interesting if you were to take a feeling down to its most primitive form. Um, you could say a feeling is, is a conjunction of many sorts of thing or or do you believe that a feeling like sadness can't be reduced no i'm sure it's complex i mean I, 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 you, we can't uh, we we can't do a lot we do, we do a little bit of parallel processing but we probably there's only so many things we can feel it at one instance but not just one thing i think i think it's complex hmm. i think it's my comp- feeling i mean it's really what well, what and I'm not a phenomenologist either. I don't like to sit in an armchair and say what is it, what what am I feeling, but uh, if I look at something, it's I there's completion. I can't see the periphery, but and yet and they're not missing them. And if there are gaps, I don't miss them. So there's all that stuff is happening. But I'm not just seeing. Well, I'm not just seeing a. Should it be a point that I'm seeing? If I were really just. If it were just one feeling, should it, if I, a visual feeling. A vi- because all sensations are feelings, so a visual feeling of looking at something, it, or in or it, let's say audition, right? Even in an audition, you have with hearing, it's you have this problem. D- to a sound is a is is a is a time series. It's not a point in time. It's a it's a series of points in time. That's where, just like a, a, a visual experience is not a point in space. It's a it's a little halo thing. So, I don't know. I d- but anyway, phenomenology is not my game either. So I, think not we've left, I think we've left my area of expertise. So. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. It's fun to sort of um, speculate about, bloviate about perhaps. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I think we did touch on functionalism, but you asked me yeah, the, asked the question you, of what's what functionalism. Yeah, what do you mean? So functionalism in philosophy of mind. Um, so some functionalists have the, have different ideas of what counts as salient function, for example. Is a naive realist a functionalist? Um, I have no idea. I have no idea. For na- naive realist just takes what you see is what you get. I, I avoid these isms because they're really... Mm. You know, if it's you can make a career out of it, a PhD out of it, if you're in philosophy. But you I'm see, not even in, in the making a PhD for the sake of just making a PhD. I mean, for the sake of just aesthetics. I'm hoping that there can be some sort of progress made from such things, but it's hard to know at the op- onset of exploring some of these isms. You have to look at them deeply, and I guess make contingent decisions about whether it's useful or not yeah so functionalism and philosophy of mind is a, it's the doctrine that what makes something a mental state of a particular type does not depend on its internal construction but rather on the way that it functions the, or the role the that, that it plays what does the way that it functions mean it sounds I like think that function. that's contingent on the circumstance in which it's you, you think it's useful Anyway, I think that's hopelessly general. What field are you in? Oh, IT. Okay, so so I can <laughs> I can insult philosophers and not bo- bother you. Uh, I think that that's useless type of stuff. Mm. I, I never I I can play the game, but I never got any enthusiasm for it. Sure. That that definition is just gave a functionalism. It's a good thing to throw out the window if you really want to know what's going on in the in the brain and if you really want to solve the easy problem for example throw out that stuff to say uh, what I mean by functionalism is basically the causal model that generates the capacities that organisms have and that's it the causal I mean, mechanism that, that can do it and I know what causality is it's it's just we're, we're just this is just reverse engineering hmm. if something is what it does that's in a sense functionalism you're saying what it is is its function or how it functions no no what i'm saying is that this is a field of science not ontology and so we're trying to answer some questions and the questions we're assigned in cognitive science are 
the easy problem and the hard problem. We have to explain how and why organisms can do what they can do. Hmm. And we also have to explain how and why they feel. Yeah. And th the explanations are going to be causal mechanisms, and that's what I mean by function. So if, fu if functionalism are, it consists of the causal mechanisms that generate blah, 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 then that's functionalism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I really sure. appreciate your, your your time and your energy. Uh, okay, it uh, wasn't very to... high. This wasn't very high this evening. I, I ran yeah, out of time. That's cool. Um, well, bear in mind, it's now ten forty six here. At hmm. six a.m., I went up on Mount Royal on the on the bike. Nice. And it's been nonstop since then. So I, oh, I'm getting yeah. to my I'm running out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Absolutely fine. It's been rather an informal sort of conversation anyway. Like, so, 